today's topic is the uh, pelvic floor, which is uh, kind of a complex topic. And unfortunately, there are lots of lots of textbooks which do not detail it enough, which is highly unfortunate, obviously. But its clinical importance is huge and it is even becoming important, more important uh, every day passing by because of the uh, surgical approaches and surgical possibilities, surgical technique is developing in order to fix the problems of the pelvic floor. So the most important thing why this uh, topic is significant also for anatomy and also for surgery is because the pelvic floor is supporting the pelvic organs, not just supporting them from below, so keeping them inside the pelvic cavity, but it is also supporting them being possible. Both of them have cavity and they have a wall structure with layers surrounding it, and they are quite soft organs themselves. So they have no firmness themselves. So they need to be connected somehow to the, uh, through the connective tissue elements in their adventitia. They have to be connected through the pelvic floor and they should be suspended onto the bony framework of the uh, pelvis. So the supportive role of the structures for the, uh, for the uh, lesser pelvis is extremely important. The pelvic floor itself is made by mostly muscles and connective tissue membranes, which can be divided into. And uh, there are some ligaments actually, but they are connected uh, through muscles and as such, it's a dynamic system for the support of the pelvic organs, so you can call it a musculoelastic system. Female, so women are, as with many aspects of life, much more complex in this matter as well, obviously because they have some extra organs inside, which are very important uh, for their functions, so because of their functions, so the uterus, the vagina, pregnancy, and so on, these um, processes change the anatomical situation very much, and giving birth to a child is also a very important function, which requires lots of changes in the, uh, in the system there, so it is very important there. Regardless of what leads to it, but there are some conditions and diseases which uh, cause loss of function of the pelvic floor. And this is very common actually in elderly women, especially those who gave birth to more than one child and in case of, of, of injury of the birth canal. So, uh, a tear of the uh, of the pelvic floor muscles might occur from from delivery injuries so this loss of function will result in prolapse of the organs so the support of the organs will be broken and they will descend and this will also result in mostly urinary incontinence which is very much reducing the life quality of such a patient so let's go through a a uh, checklist what we are going to talk about today. So first of all, we will do the structures which are contributing to the pelvic floor. A very quick review of first semester material about bones, joints and ligaments. Then we will go through the muscles and then we will uh, also address the uh, connective tissue elements, the membrane. Then I am going to talk about the function of these structures, so how the pelvic organs will be supported. And then we will also cover the uh, pelvic cavity in relation to the uh, different uh, pelvic floor uh, structure layers and to the peritoneum, so parts of the pelvic cavity. And after that, we will also really, really quickly go through the perineal anatomy. You will have uh, 
basic information in the slides. If you see an exclamation mark here in the top left corner, that slide is including basic information which you are required to know for the exam. Some non-highlighted slides also will be included in the lecture which do not have such an exclamation mark. This is advanced level information which is needed for a better understanding. And uh, there are some slides which include both, so basic information and uh, additional supplementary information as well. And in these cases, you have underlined basic knowledge underlined, okay? So first of all, the bones. Remember these from first semester, even though they are not really included in the second semester topics, you are expected to at least know the basics about them. So what is the pelvic inclination, the pelvic tilt? What's the difference between greater and lesser pelvis? What is the linear terminalis? So what makes the lesser pelvic inlet? What makes the lesser pelvic exit? What are the measurements of the lesser pelvis? We won't ask you the exact centimeters. You just have to know what is pelvic amplitude, what is pelvic uh, uh, angustia and such things. And what about transverse, oblique and sagittal diameters? So you should know that. You have the exam already, so you are expected to know that. And also the static characteristics of the pelvis, so because of the inclination and such things, how the body weight is supported by the pelvis and how the forces are conducted onto the legs through the hip joint. So these first semester topics are important uh, and providing lots of background information, a lot of uh, background knowledge for these uh, second semester topics. So really, really quickly go through the joints and ligaments. So back here you have the sacral bone, here you have the two hip bones, which are then connected by the sacroiliac joint, which is an amphiarthrosis. It's a plain joint with no actual movements. And here you have the pubic symphysis, which is a synchondrotic connection, so it's a continuous joint. The two ligaments which, uh, which uh, stabilize the, uh, the sacrum further are the sacrospinous ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament. And even though it is not included in this picture, it is also important to note that uh, in between the sciatic bone and the pubic bone, you have the obturator foramen, which is containing the obturator membrane. And also please remember that you have the inguinal ligament as well. So with this very quick revision of first semester material, let's uh, uh, further continue into the actual topic of the muscles. So the muscles are divided into three categories, three major groups. You have the first group, which is the uh, parietal muscles. The parietal muscles we uh, have seen already in first semester in the gluteal region. So the piriformis muscle and the obturator internus muscle are included here. The picture is not showing the position of them in 3D very well. So the piriformis muscle is above the obturator internus. It is originating from the pelvic surface of the sacral bone and the muscle and its tendon is to the great sciatic form dividing it into supra and infrapiriformis hiatus, whereas the obturator internus muscle is located below the uh, sciatic uh, or ischiac spine, so it is passing through the lesser sciatic foramen. The uh, second group of muscles are forming the pelvic diaphragm. You basically have diaphragm like muscle systems in the pelvis, the pelvic diaphragm is the superior one. It is consisting of two large muscles. The first one is called the levator ani muscle, which is further divided into parts. The most medial one, which is forming a loop around the rectum, is called the puborectalis muscle. This is also the strongest part of the levatorani muscle, so containing the most amount of skeletal muscle. Then the next part is called pubococcygeus part, which comes here. And the largest part, I mean large, it's most wide, but not 
the most muscular part is the iliococcygeus part. The pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus form a plate here inferior and anterior to the coccyx and the sacrum. And this is located also behind the rectum. This plate is called the levator plate, or LP, abbreviated in Latin. This is very important for the support of the enlarged part of the rectum, which you call the ampulla of the rectum. You also have some prerectal fibers, so which are crossing in front of the rectum and the anal opening. And here, in between the medial margin of the two puborectalis muscles, you have the levator hiatus which will be divided by the prerectal fibers into a urogenital and an anal or rectal hiatus. These three parts, the puborectal, pubococcygeus, and iliococcygeus, are the main three parts of the levator ani, which are belonging to the actual pelvic diaphragm. But you also have a puboanal and pubovaginal part, obviously pubovaginal only in female. The uh, part which is surrounding the rectum, so the puborectalis and prerectal muscles here, these continue downwards and are basically almost fused together with the uh, external longitudinal muscle layer of the rectum, forming a longitudinal anal muscle, which is abbreviated LAM or LMA. And then it ends at the level of the uh, external anal sphincter muscle, which according to some textbooks is also a part of the levatorani. Some other textbooks don't uh, highlight this uh, fact very much. They uh, uh, just say that the uh, external anal sphincter is, uh, is a superficial muscle of the uh, perineum. Okay, so what you have to know for the exam, puborectal part, pubococcygeus part, and on the outside attached to this, you have the external anal sphincter. So these are the uh, parts of the levatorani. The next muscle, which also contributes to the formation of the pelvic diaphragm, is called the coccygeus muscle, which starts here at the side of the uh, coccygeal bone and the sacrum, and it goes to the sciatic spine and also connects to the sacrospinous ligament. The third group of muscles, which is inferior to the previous one, and it is uh, uh, covering the uh, levator hiatus, more precisely the uh, anterior parts of the urogenital uh, uh, hiatus of that levator uh, hiatus. So that's the pathology of the perineal membrane, abbreviated PM. You also have the sphincters at this level. So if uh, there are, you have such a textbook which the uh, external uh, which contains the external anal sphincter as superficial muscle here, then it is located here. There are other textbooks which list it under the parts of the levatorani muscle. It does not really make a difference very much, so the function is the same. It is an external anal sphincter. Nevertheless, okay, but which belong to the urogenital diaphragm or perineal membrane, uh, these are the uh, deep transverse perineal muscle, which in most textbooks or most atlas pictures is uh, like this. This picture suggests that the deep transverse perineal muscle does indeed contain quite a lot of muscle fibers. Muscle f that is not really true. The deep transverse perineal muscle is much more membrane, much more connective tissue than actual muscle. It does contain some skeletal muscle though, so it is indeed a muscle, but it's not that strong, not that much of muscle tissue inside. The other muscles which are located superficial to the uh, deep transverse perineal muscle, so they are closer to the surface, closer to the skin, and in anatomical position, they are located below the deep transverse perineal muscle, have much more muscle tissue, so they are definitively uh, visible muscles. 
the bulbospongiosus muscle, the ischiocavernosus muscle, and the superficial transverse perineal muscle are the three members of this group. Obviously, you have a left and right of each such muscles. Here, where you have this so-called perineal body, or it is also called in anatomical terminology, sandon, okay? That's where the urogenital diaphragm muscle parts of the urogenital diaphragm are connected to the pelvic diaphragm muscle parts. This picture again shows it as if it was some crossing of muscles, but in reality, this perineal body is actually a connective tissue part. There are muscles connected to it, but it is it in itself a connective tissue body. You also have another uh, membrane slash ligament here, which is called the enococcygeal ligament, or in clinical terminology, it is called the postanal plate or PAP, which is serving as an extra elevator plate, which is made by, again, the pubococcygeal and iliococcygeal parts of the levatorani muscle. The sphincter muscles, so you have the internal and external anal sphincter, and you also have the external urethral sphincter. These are the sphincter muscles. The uh, anal sphincters obviously surround the uh, anal opening, and the external anal opening is skeletal muscle, and according to some textbooks, it is belonging to the levatorani. The internal anal sphincter is made of smooth muscle, and it is made by the uh, intrinsic internal uh, circular muscle layer of the uh, rectum. The uh, external urethral sphincter is also skeletal muscle. It is located here surrounding the external urethral orifice, or in male where the uh, membranaceous part of the male urethra is located where it pierces the urogenital diaphragm. This is in some textbooks mentioned as an individual muscle, so it is separated from the uh, deep transfer cell that uh, it's a strong part of the deep transverse perineal muscle. Um, this, again, does not make much of a difference. It depends on your personal preference, which one you want to say in the exam. The uh, important thing is that where the urethra is piercing the urogenital diaphragm, there you have a quite strong external urethral sphincter muscle surrounding it. Okay, so this was the basic information about the... Uh, three groups of muscles and the two levels of diaphragms, the urogenital and uh, pelvic diaphragm. This picture, this uh, slide shows you a slightly different uh, division of these muscles, which is actually from a clinical point of view or a, or a functional point of view is a better division of the muscles, but this is not what you are expected to know for the anatomy exam. So the muscles make three parts and three layers in both anterior-posterior relation and superior-inferior relation. So you have front, middle, and posterior level, and you have uh, upper or inner layer, middle layer, and outer layer. And then you have a, a crossing of, of muscle uh, systems. So, to the front superior, you have the pubococcygeus and puborectal muscle parts of the levatorani. Posterior, the top level, you have the iliococcygeus part of the levatorani. And pubococcygeus and iliococcygeus together in the posterior part make the so-called levator plate. Then in the middle, you have those longitudinal fibers, uh, which um, go along the end piece of the rectum, 
And then inferiorly to the front, you have the urogenital diaphragm, and posteriorly, you have the anocoxygeal ligament and the external anal sphincter. The anocoxygeal ligament is located inferior to the levator plate made by the iliocoxygeus muscle and provides further to it. Okay. The reasoning behind this uh, uh, second version of how we can divide the pelvic floor muscles is because of the function. So the function of these muscles is first is supporting the organs, keeping them inside the pelvic cavity, but all sides yeah, continence, both anal continence and uh, and uh, urine continence. First, let's talk about how the rectum is kept closed. So anal continence is made by the puborectal muscles and the anal sphincters together. It's not just the anal sphincters which prevent you from soiling yourself. The uh, puborectal muscle is equally important. Here you see the curvature of the rectum. Up here you have the sacral curvature and here you have or flexure and here you have the anorectal or uh, perineal curvature. And there you see the arrowhead is indicating the direction how the puborectal muscle is surrounding this second uh, lower curvature of the rectum. Thus, this part, this angle is increased if the puborectal muscle is in place and functioning well. Okay, and thus the weight of the rectum is not put on to the opening, but instead to the posterior part of the uh, levatorani muscle and the uh, anocoxygeal ligament. So that is keeping the weight of the rectum and not the sphincter has to withstand the weight of the uh, rectum and the feces inside the ampulla. How do we open our bowels? So basically, so that's called defecation in the uh, scientific language. So basically what happens is this middle part, this longitudinal muscle part is starting to contract and the puborectalis muscle is relaxing. With this, this angle in the uh, anorectal or perineal structure is decreasing and thus this outflow pathway will be made straight and obviously also the sphincter muscles will be relaxed. And then the uh, bowels can be opened and the feces can be uh, removed. The urinary continence is very similar. You have the uh, muscles to the front of the bladder and the urethra and the muscles posterior to the bladder and the urethra. In a normal state, when you are storing the urine, both muscles, so both parts, both the anterior and the posterior muscles are actively contracting and thus there is an angle between the uh, bladder this bone of the bladder and the urethra. If the anterior muscles are relaxed and the posterior muscles are contracting, this bottom part of the uh, bladder will be pulled slightly posteriorly and thus this angle disappears and the urine can flow straight into the urethra. So basically this is how you pass urine. So anterior muscles and the sphincters are relaxed. Uh, you don't need to pay attention what these exact uh, abbreviations mean. So LP is levator plate, LMA or LAM is uh, longitudinal muscle. And here um, you have the anterior muscles with a pel uh, pubourethral ligament and, and, and pubococcygeal muscle. You don't need that. You just need 
to understand that there are muscles anterior, there are muscles posterior, and there are muscles. These in the middle and posterior are remaining active, whereas the anterior muscles are uh, relaxing, and that's how you pass urine. With this, you can also understand why uh, pelvic floor injury is causing urinary incontinence because the anterior muscles will be damaged during childbirth or with age. So if they are damaged, they cannot keep up with the uh, strength. So posterior muscles remain or retain their activity, they retain their strength. So the uh, so the prolapse or descending of the organs will result in incomplete uh, sphincter function. So the path will be straightened continuously. You cannot make this angle here, which is required for normal continence. OK, so this first part about the muscle structure and function is finished by now. Let's move on to the fascia, the connective tissue parts. Here, the most important thing is that this fascia is much more complex than fascia of other body parts. So the uh, fascia of muscles of the limbs, which you have learned in first semester, or the fascia layers of the uh, um, so endothoracic or transverse fascia of the abdominal wall and the thoracic wall. These pelvic fascia layers are more complex. Why? They are not only connective tissue, but there are some smooth muscles as well. This makes especially clinical terminology very confusing because sometimes these structures which are made by the pelvic fascia are referred to as ligament and sometimes as muscle. So you have, for instance, puboureteral muscle and puboureteral ligament. Actually, you have both in the same structure. So it should be called ligament and muscle together. But we don't have such terms. So that's it. Another important thing is that there are strong actual connective tissue ligaments formed by the connective tissue of, the, uh, of these uh, fascia layers or of the uh, general object connective tissue inside the lesser pelvis. These are mostly supporting and surrounding arteries. So you will have the branches of the internal iliac artery supplying the uh, pelvic organs located in the middle of the pelvic cavity. So arteries are passing to the organs from the lateral wall of the pelvis towards the middle, so they are going in the, that direction. And usually they are accompanied by strong ligaments, which are further suspending the organs onto the bony framework of the uh, pelvis. So not just the inferior support provided by the uh, urogenital and uh, pelvic diaphragm is important, but also the Suspension ligaments and the fascia. If the fascia or the ligaments are broken, damaged for whatever reason, that puts too much stress on the muscles. So the muscles also cannot fulfill the function correctly. And that condition, just like muscle damage, will later result in uh, incontinence and dysfunction of the pelvic floor. So what I wanted to say with this is that it is equally important to have both systems ready and functioning well, so the muscles and the ligaments. All right. Uh, sorry, this is a quite uh, uh, complex slide. So there are two main layers of the uh, fascia. You have a parietal fascia, which has two main parts. First of all, the obturator internus muscle has its fascia. 
and the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm or membrane. These together make the so-called parietal fascia layer, the parietal connective tissue layer. And you also have an endopelvic or visceral layer of the fascia. Uh, as a side note, please do not get confused by these terms. In other parts, like in the chest or in the abdomen, these terms, parietal and visceral, were referring to the layers of the serous membranes, so the mesothelium, like pleura and, and uh, peritoneum. In the pelvis, however, you don't have this serous membrane. You have instead the same terms, parietal, visceral, used for the connective tissue membrane. Okay, so visceral fascia or endopelvic fascia. This is also divided into two parts. First of all, you have the superior fascia of the pelvic diaphragm, and you also have the fascia of the pelvic organs, which is actually their outermost histologic layer. In histology, this connective tissue layer surrounding uh, an organ, a layered organ, is called the adventitia layer. In this case, this adventition is extremely strong. So instead of loose connective tissue with fat, which is normally the adventitia of such an organ, this is instead containing quite a lot of collagen fibers and also some elastic ones. But nevertheless, it is dense connective tissue. So the fascia of the pelvic organs. All right. Between the, these, uh, these different parts, so between the uh, organs in the middle and the fascia of the pelvic diaphragm and the pelvic diaphragm itself, here you have this uh, connective tissue, fat and blood vessel and also nerve filled space. These spaces are called like this. So you name the, uh, you, you, you take the name of the organ, which is in the middle of the pelvic cavity, and put para in front of the name of the organ. So anteriorly, where you have the bladder, you have the paravesical space. In the middle, in female, this is only in female, you have the vagina and the uterus. So you have parametrium next to the uterus and paracolpium next to the vagina. Metra and colpus are also uh, names for uterus and vagina. And posteriorly, where you have the rectum, you have the pararectal space. In these spaces, so you do have uh, fat, some loose connective tissue, blood vessels, uh, venous networks and arteries, and some nerves, nerve plexuses as well. But that's not the only thing. In some specific areas, this connective tissue is forming actual ligaments. Especially important are these ligaments for the female genital organs, because as in with the previous slide, I also started to, uh, to uh, explain this. So these are uh, belonging to the suspension of the pelvic organs, especially the uterus and the vagina. Okay, furthermore, you do have two strong arch-like uh, parts of the pelvic fascia. The first one with the black dot here is the tendinous arch of the levator ani muscle, or in Latin, arcus tendineus of levator ani, which is abbreviated in the clinical terminology as ATLA. This is a part of the obturator internus fascia, and this is serving as the origin of the iliococcygeus part of the levatorani muscle. The second one here, in between the uh, two layers, two parts of the endopelvic fascia or visceral fascia, so in between the uh, vaginal fascia here and the superior fascia of the uh, levatorani muscle or pelvic diaphragm muscle, here you have the ATFP or tendinous arch of the pelvic fascia, or precisely of the endopelvic fascia. This is a little bit advanced information, so you are not required to, to know this 
uh, to pass the exam, actually, but it is one of the key structures for the uh, support of the vagina. So this is indeed important because this is what can be fixed if you have a damaged and dilated pubotractal and pubococcygeus part of the levatorani here. So if this, uh, this, uh, this support of the uh, organs is broken, that is the part which can be fixed, this ATFP part. Okay, Retius space. This space is referred to the space behind the pubic symphysis and in front of the bladder and the urethra. This is a so-called uh, avascular part. Avascular means, well, actually no blood vessels is a little bit harsh. It has no major blood vessels. So this is where you can uh, surgically approach this area next to the vagina. And here you have the uh, levatorani muscle, here you have the lateral wall of the vagina, and there you have this ATFP. So if you need surgical fix, then this is how you can operate. So laparoscopic uh, operation of this uh, levatorani and vagina connection, which you also can call levator vagina attachment or vagina levator attachment VLA here. Okay, so this is it. This can be sutured and made stronger in order to, uh, to, uh, to uh, put back the muscles into their original place and, and, and to solve the problem of these patients. So that's where you can do the operation. Okay, this was the membranes and their clinical uh, importance. Then we move on to those ligaments which are found around blood vessels and some others which are not found around blood vessels. But Regardless of they are related to or unrelated to blood vessels, they belong to the uh, suspension, suspensory structures of the uh, pelvic organs. So first of all, the, uh, again, female version, because this is the most important. So around the uh, cervix of the uterus, you have a so-called cervical ring. From the cervical ring, you have on both sides a ligament going to the front, to the pubic symphysis or to the pubic bone, a ligament going to the side, and a ligament going to the back, to the sacrum. The ligament which goes to the pubic bone is called pubo-uterine ligament, but because the bladder is in between, it is divided into pubo-vesical and vesico-uterine ligaments. This is not included in this picture, but it will be in the next. The ligament which is moving to the side is called transverse cervical ligament, which is supporting the uterine artery. This ligament in clinical terminology is called the cardinal ligament. And then going posteriorly, you have the rectouterine or sacrouterine ligament. Actually, it's a ligament system consisting of both. So you also have rectouterine and also have sacrouterine ligament at the same time. Just it, uh, uh, it, it depends on uh, which is the end. So where does it end to the side of the rectum or goes behind the sacrum. So these are here around the uh, uh, cervical ring or originating from the cervical ring, and these suspend the uh, uterus. There are also ligaments lateral to the rectum, lateral 
rectal ligament, which is supporting the middle rectal artery, and you also have the lateral vesical ligament. The uh, English terminology is sometimes um, strange and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sometimes uh, phrased wrong. It should be called vesicular ligament since the bladder is 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 vesica urinaria in latin so urinary bladder bladder translates into latin as vesica vesicula means small bladder so it's not vesicular it should be vesical ligament but yeah people who make these uh, uh, english terms are not all, always uh, good with Latin, but never mind. Okay, let's move on. So uh, told you that the previous picture is not completely addressing the uh, supportive ligaments or suspensory ligaments of the uterus, but this one is. This whole system is called the uterine retinacle. So the cervix and cervix and the cervical ring is the middle. That's kind of a keystone here. And there you have the cardinal ligament. There you have the uh, vesico-uterine and pubovesical ligaments. Together, pubo-uterine ligament. And here you have sacro-uterine ligament or uh, recto-uterine ligament also does exist. Very important thing is that the uh, cardinal ligament is including the uterine artery and it is crossing the ureter. Please note that it is essentially important. Another uh, ligament which is belonging to this um, suspensory system of the uterus is the round ligament of the uterus, which is going into the uh, inguinal canal and ends in the subcutaneous tissue of the major labia. But the round ligament of the uterus is not having a function in a normal state uterus. Uh, should retake that. So in non-pregnant uterus, it has no function. It is only helping to keep the uh, uterus position and the anteflexion position of the uterus in a pregnant uterus. So the round ligament is not important in normal, in a, in a, in non-pregnant state. It's only important for pregnant uterus. Okay, this is another uh, picture taken from a, a very old uh, textbook. It's from uh, 66. So these things, these information which I was uh, sharing with you are not new things. It's just somehow in, in most of the uh, anatomy textbooks, it's not, not highlighted enough, unfortunately, but this is very important. Okay. Let's really quickly go through how these function and how the uh, ligament systems and the muscles work together. So first thing to uh, understand is the ligament system and how it is connected to the organs. And this thing here is divided into to an anterior part and the posterior part. The anterior part is how the vagina is suspended. So here you have the cardinal ligament. Here you have the ATFP, so the connection between levator ani fascia and vagina, this vaginal levator uh, attachment. So that is making a, a membrane which is more or less horizontal here, and this is called the midvaginal hammock. And this is where the bladder is put onto. So this is supporting the bladder. If, in case you don't know what a hammock is, this is it. Okay, then you have the uh, uterine retinaculum as middle part. Let's skip this because we have already uh, talked about that. And the posterior part is explaining how the rectum and the posterior wall of the vagina is uh, connected. There you have a rectovaginal plate, which is also a fascia layer. And the structures which are supporting these things, so rectum and vagina, the paracolpium, so the connective tissue located in the space laterally to the vagina, the lateral rectal ligament, 
and the perineal body. And also behind the rectum, you will have the levator plate. So this means that the muscles are not directly connected to the organs. They attach to the bone on the side and the ligament system of the pelvic floor. And these ligaments are conducting the force, so connecting the organ to the muscles. So normal muscle function and healthy ligaments are all needed to have everything in correct position and for correct function in the pelvis. Then we are skipping to the next part. So levels of pelvic cavity. There are three main levels here. The first main level here at the inlet of the pelvis is actually the peritoneum, so the most inferior parts of the peritoneal cavity. Then you have a so-called subperitoneal cavity between the peritoneum and the pelvic diaphragm. The third level down here is the perineum, which is further divided into a deep perineal space, a superficial, and also you have a subcutaneous perineal space, but you don't need that this detailed. The important thing is that here, the deep perineal space is also connected to the ischiorectal or ischioanal fossa. It again depends on which textbook you are uh, reading. Some textbooks say that the ischioanal fossa is only connected to the deep perineal space. Some other textbooks say it is included in the deep perineal space. Does not really matter. The uh, ischiorectal fossa is a definite cavity a definitive part of the uh, of the pelvis so you have to know that that it does exist and it's located there okay we uh, don't have any more time but just really really quickly so perineal female perineal and male perineal anatomy the perineum itself is this part of the skin between the anus and the scrotal sac in male and between the vaginal opening and the anal opening in female. This area is divided into an anal region and the urogenital region. The urogenital region is containing the external uh, genital organs. Female version is again much more complex and important and i am showing you this so here you have the uh, urogenital diaphragm with its deep and uh, superficial uh, muscles and here you have the levatorani and posteriorly you have the gluteal muscles so if you come here in between the uh, levatorani muscle and the deep transverse perineal muscle that's where you have the uh, the ischioanal fossa and as a quick reminder, the pudendal canal with the internal pudendal artery vein and pudendal nerve is also included there. So the actual lateral wall of the uh, ischiorectal fossa is the obturator internus muscle, and medially you have the inferior surface of the levatorani muscle. Okay, I am skipping this because that's not important and we don't have that much time. If you are interested, you can uh, read it. And this is the last slide. This shows you a little bit more detailed division of these perineal spaces. So you have subcutaneous, superficial, deep perineal space. And here, this uh, ischiorectal fossa is called subfascial space here. That's another uh, variation in, in terminology. So actually the deep perineal space should be including that as well. And then you have the subperitoneal space or infraperitoneal space. Would like you uh, to, uh, I would like to remind you so that you understand and remember that this subperitoneal space is including the pelvic organs in the middle and those spaces which we have listed to the side in between the bones and the side of the organs, so that paravesical, paracolpium, parametrium, and pararectal pieces. Okay, so remember that, please. So the subperitoneal space will be divided into these parts.
OK. And this is again a schematic drawing which summarizes the support of the pelvic organs. We talked about this in detail, so uh, I just put here so you have it in one picture all together.